Welcome to another episode of the Pay, Play, Profit podcast. I'm Jessica May, your co-host, and today I'm with Marilyn, and we're going to dive into payroll. <laughs> More specifically, guys, how people and culture is bigger than processing payroll. Interesting topic today, huh, Marilyn? It is. Get outside the HR box here. <laughs> yeah. Or get outside the payroll box, rather, the right into box, the yeah. HR box. That's yeah. how, how we were thinking about this. So, yeah, I'm excited about today's episode. So, let's dive in. Let's go. Okay, Marilyn, here we are talking on the podcast again. <laughs> and we've decided that the exciting topic should be about payroll or actually not about payroll. Yeah. The more and, exciting part is the people. Yeah, the exciting part is the people. But I think the reason why we wanted to bring this up is because the audience that we serve on our podcast and the our podcast listeners and people who actually end up becoming clients of ours, they're typically team-based businesses, you know, right. and that team can be two to five people, maybe as many as 10 or more. But the sweet spot really is that two to 10 where there's just more than the owner working in the business and or the owner is working in the business and they're paying themselves payroll. So today's episode really isn't about that solo owner just paying themselves payroll and it's the process of payroll. It's really thinking about and talking through what we're experiencing ourselves and we see our clients experiencing is that when we get started with a team, we know we have to pay them. Yeah. And that's, that's kind of where it stops. Uh -huh. Is so, that true? Yeah. I mean, that's what most people think of and they don't go much further until it's a problem. Yeah. <laughs> or for whatever reason, there's just like, I got to get payroll in place. And sometimes a lot of times our clients have 1099 contractors that they're working with inside their businesses. And then there's a transition to payroll and putting them on payroll and all that becomes involved in that. And you actually sit as our finance and HR chair inside our business at the bottom line. And the easy grab is like, hey, we got people, we got to pay them. Let's make sure we process payroll every two weeks. And, and then that's it, right? So I'd love to hear more and I'd love for our, our listeners to hear more about this journey of your you know, role in our business as a finance and HR person, knowing that payroll has to be done, but also understanding you care deeply about our culture and you care deeply as do I about our people. And what have been some of the surprising things that you've learned in your journey as we've grown together as partners and in this business with a team? Well, probably for me would be how, how far ahead you need to think in regards to your, your employees, because I'm not one... I'm a kind of fly by the seat of my pants kind of girl. Case in point would be last week when we had employee um, appreciation day and I didn't even know it. <laughs> I had not, like it had not come across my vision until the day before. So there's the things you really got to probably have a better handle on and put on the calendar so you're thinking ahead. And really, I, I learned from you probably more than than most about what the HR function should be, not just cutting checks for payroll. You know, or signing off on a handbook. Or signing off on a handbook or getting the just the, the black and whites done on a checklist. It's more about really finding ways to communicate with your employees how important they are and you know how much they're appreciated and and also those things that corrective actions you've got to take in a way that builds your people up, not tears them down. I think that's probably the, the biggest thing I've learned, even though some of that I knew, it's harder than you think it is. It's much harder than you think it is until you get into the, the, the details of it and what's got to be done. 
Yeah. And I think, you know, where our dear listeners are probably at, this is where a lot of us start. Doesn't even matter if you have 10 people right now. Payroll could be a process that's very undone for you, even with 10 people Mm -hmm. in the business. And one of the things that we learned about people and culture, it was actually one of the first processes through the EOS journey we've been on that we actually fully documented from end to end because it was a pretty straightforward you know these are the things that have to happen in your people and culture process and for those of you listening if you're doing payroll but that still feels clunky at best and you're scrambling to gather all the cash to make payroll you don't have the right systems in place to track time or know what your people are doing you don't have checks and balances in place you feel out of compliance with payroll I'd love to say that people and culture kind of starts with payroll because that's where the trust building starts, right? Right. Right. I come on board to earn a living and my minimum, my low bar, my lowest bar that I have as a team member, no matter how I'm being paid, whether as a contractor or a team member, as a W-2 employee, and there is a difference, is that you're going to pay me what I am supposed to be paid And you're going to pay me on time and the check's going to clear. Right. So people and culture kind of does start with payroll, right? Because if you can't get that right, there's nothing else to do. No, none of the rest matters if you can't do that one. Yeah. Truly. I mean, Mm -hmm. because you can have the best intentions there is, but if you can't get that one right, um, your people aren't going to see anything else. Yeah. And that's going to create the culture. Mm -hmm. And so... I would say that people and culture actually does start with payroll, making that offer, honoring that commitment, making sure the exchange that everyone mutually agreed upon at the time of hiring actually happens. But then now you have a team member. And even if it's just one person, you now have to do things. Whereas when it's one or two people, it's like, I'm going to go do these things either when it comes into my view or it's a problem. Right. There's the kind of no intentionality behind Mm -hmm. creating the foundation for the people and the culture, because there's kind of this, I would like to say lie that we all absorb of like, well, it's just the two of us. So what does it matter? Do you think that that's true, that we can actually minimize the scale of what we're doing? So therefore, we just don't do the other things that are really important to take care of people? Oh, I I totally do. And I'm I'd be one of those people that tended to do that (laughs) until we got a bigger team. I mean, when it was me and you, yeah, we didn't do team building, not formally. You know what I mean? Right. So, because we all start somewhere. So, I do want the listener to hear right now like, you can't go to like having a fully functioning HR department when you can't get the basics down, like payroll. (laughs) Right. You know, but you've got to understand early that it's bigger than payroll. So what things can you start putting in place as you go and grow to help create your people and culture process? And there's there's plenty of resources out there to help. Mm -hmm. I I do think that's really important, but you just got to make it a priority to walk that path of of finding those things out. Right. Yeah. Because there is that HR component now. You you actually don't get to have people and, and actually abdicate the responsibility of human resources. No, you don't. And that's what I think we've been really challenged by of putting the structure in place for human resources. Would you say mm-hmm. that's true? It, it is, and it, it's not uh, subject to your whim. <laughs> it's not subject to, you know, what you feel like at the time. It's actually fairly black and white on a lot of, levels yeah it is like well it's little things like having a handbook in place when you actually bring an employee on and a lot of people I feel like people treat handbooks almost like they treat operating agreements when they Mm -hmm. form their businesses they either don't exist or if they do they haven't read it they've just got some template they pull together and they've almost said here's my handbook And really the handbook is like one of the most important people and culture tools that you actually have in your arsenal when you get those things in place, because it does outline the agreement that's going to be made to help your business stay compliant. But also it's the thing that the employee is going to know, like, this is what my expectations should be. And these are what is going to be expected of me in return. And 
a lot of times when we start working with clients, they actually don't have operating agreements in place, even for their single member businesses, and they should. And when we start working with clients who actually have employees, they don't have handbooks in place. Mm -mm. But your handbooks, yeah, your handbook has, I mean, in our handbook, we have our values represented in there. We have how we track time in there, what your benefits are. We have to comply in every state that we have an employee. So that's the other thing we really learned about handbooks in the remote environment that we're in today is like, it does require your time and your energy and your money if you decide to have a team. And you have a team, whether it's 1099 or W-2, and that's Mm going to require some time, energy, and money. Right. Because that, too, is a trust builder. Like, I think that's the big thing, Marilyn, is like we discovered in that proven process that everything we do over here in payroll and HR is a trust builder. When it, I think it's on both sides because it's, it's, we've run into this many, many times. I mean, you can state what your policies are over and over and over again, but people don't remember, right? right? So you, you do not want it unclear. You want it very clear, you know, in essence, the contract between you and the employer and the employee. That can really be very, very important when you get into some a disagreement, okay? So, and I, I would dare to say that if the employer doesn't have a handbook, they're the ones that are going to be on uh, the side that has to, to argue and yeah. justify the actions, not the employee. Yeah, correct. And, 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 and when that's the case, because because that's extremely important. So that's the trust builder. And then we also determined, you know, quarterly conversations were trust builders and Mm -hmm. L10s and those happening when they were supposed to happen in our business were trust builders because Mm -hmm. those were times where people could expect that they were going to get their issues solved and they were going to get to fellowship with each other and share good news. And, and then we had books that we require our team read um, as part of that process. And that's a trust builder. And, toolboxes about how are we going to solve personal issues among team members and how are we going to clear the air when the team is having a big problem and that there's a tension in the room you could literally cut like a slice of cake those are tools to help the team build trust because one of the things we learned in the five dysfunctions of a team by Patrick Lencioni was when there's dysfunction at the very base of that pyramid is there's a trust issue yes and people and culture is designed to have tons of trust builders built into it, you know, and be the checks and balances to the people that are leading and managing your team. Right. I think it's helped us build trust within our team dramatically. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, the whole process has helped our our company itself. Yeah, 100 mm-hmm. percent. And that I think that's why you and I were just like, we got to talk about this because I think people just think, oh, I, I have payroll and I'm done. And mm-hmm. I send I send my team a gift card every now and then. And and those are all great things. I don't want to water that stuff down. Those yeah. are really important. But there is an HR role that has to be filled inside the organization, which is what we discovered. Right. Because we haven't even gotten into teams that are growing. Mm -mm. And what that means for HR, where there's a constant, like, we have to be recruiting talent and bringing people on and inside Mm -hmm. a pipeline to attract employees the same way we attract people onto our email list for client acquisition and things like that. Like, and when we actually looked at the weight of like, okay, well, the career door has always got to be open and we've mm-hmm. always got to be interviewing and we've got to be nurturing candidates and stuff like that. Cause we intend to keep hiring. It's, it's like a heavy weight. Mm-hmm. It is. <laughs> it's a little overwhelming a lot of times. <laughs> and, and I wanted to say on that front is that I kind of resisted this role a lot just because I am a fly by the seat of my pants kind of girl, but I do think it's important that you have somebody that goes along with you that can relieve um, some of that anxiety and also help help you do the best job possible. So we do believe in going two by two. So that's been a big help just to kind of understand I'm not alone in, in this role. So, But I think to your point too, it's really important the people that you have doing this role, especially at the leadership level, like 
they understand those things. And for you, you've, we've all had to on the leadership team because we've all got seats sitting there. Like we're all having to reach up so tremendously. It's like nuts. Mm -hmm. And that in and of itself is very daunting, especially for our listener that might, you might be a service-based organization. And I feel like there's like, all we want to do is say there's special circumstances about why we can't tackle something right now because it's tax season. Mm -hmm. And what's so great about your role, Marilyn, is like, well, no matter what season we're in, this still has to happen. Still has to happen. It can't be kicked and it can't be forgotten and it can't be left because that's a threat. Mm -hmm. If we don't actually stay consistent in how we deal with people and culture if we don't keep the trust builders in place that we know are effective in work, and if we're not actively recruiting new talent so that we're ready when we're ready to bring on more clients, like that's a threat to our growth. And that's been the greatest challenge, I think, above all. Right. And then recognizing the difference between leadership and management. And can I just say, y'all, like I'm not a manager. (laughs) Like managing people, like... When, I, when they start talking about leading and managing equals accountability for us, and you have four or five people that you're accountable to, like, I'm fine with the leadership piece, but I absolutely am not equipped to be as patient as I need to be or should be when it comes to managing people. Right. And it's really kind of humbling to realize there are weaknesses that you shouldn't be trying to reach up for. You should have the right people in the right seat, which is another function of that HR role, right? It, it is. And the challenge of, of getting through that process of putting the right people in the right seats is it can be frustrating. It mm-hmm. can really be frustrating, but it, you got to get there. Because it also takes time. Mm-hmm. And we've got a whole podcast planned, guys, about discussing the challenges of growth and capacity. And I can't wait for you guys to hear that because we're getting into a little bit of that right now. Mm-hmm. but. I definitely, because we care about people so much and because we don't have a business without our team, we just don't. Mm -mm. We don't have a business without clients, but we really don't have a business without our team. And the one thing I do enjoy about, the the best thing I I enjoy about the the HR piece is the culture Mm -hmm. piece of it and the connection with the, the team. And, you know, because it's real easy when you're virtual to feel like an island. Yes. And not really, you know, communicate too much. And we've worked really hard and I think done a, a pretty good job yes. at making sure everyone feels like a team. That we know each other and we appreciate each other and their gifts. And we get together sometimes and just kind of let our hair down and play. Yes. So, And, you know, I've noticed that you've had, so one of the reasons why we have a, Friday all team, which is now about 30 minutes long, and and we're still small enough to where we can <laughs> take that time to spend 30 minutes on Friday for the whole team to get together. So number one, make sure your HR person is there because it can get a little wild by the time you get into minute 20. And mm-hmm. you got to kind of keep things uh, a little safe, um, if you will. <laughs> but I know you have championed for that Friday all team, you know, because to you, that connection piece was extremely important. That what wasn't just a time to like get things done, like mm-hmm. to have that social aspect of it. And you know, I know you care deeply about harmony and fellowship and connection, and I do too, just on a totally different level. So mm-hmm. from my seat, I'm championing those core values and making sure people understand what those values are. But from your seat, you're like creating that culture of connection. Mm-hmm. And so again, that's right. the two by two, right? Because the values are equally important to you, but how you and I walk that out and how we deliver on that inside the business as leaders in the business are two totally different approaches. And I think they that's are important. Di- yeah, there are two totally different approaches, but they actually mesh very well if you can get them from both sides. So Yeah. And you know, the other part that I learned through the Friday All Team, which is just such a good, because we were trying to decide whether to keep them, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so right. I almost feel like this podcast is turning into a little bit of a promo of how are you going to build in fun time? Mm -hmm. And it can't just be once a quarter or something like, how are you going to keep this team connected as humans and not just teammates? Because one of the things that happened is we have a core value of speaking out. 
And so for those listening, you're in a business, you have a business, you're leading your business. And it's really easy when you're in that role to say, I'm too busy to go to something like that, or I've got other priorities that I need to spend that 30 minutes on. And that was me. Like that's a client meeting I could have had, or that's a 30 minutes of work that I could get done, or that's my clarity break that I can make happen. Like I really felt like that was more for the team and, and at some point not for me. And so it's not that I didn't necessarily want to go, but I didn't make it like a priority to go. So if there was something that could slide in there, I would let it. Mm -hmm. And thankfully in our culture, we had one of our team members who privately spoke out to me and said, it's really important that you come to these all teams. And I really enjoy you participating and seeing you on there. And your team wants to connect with its leaders. Right. They want to be in the room with you and they don't want it to always be about what are we going to get done. Right. And I thought that that was just a really awesome moment. And I haven't missed an all team since unless I was out. Mm -hmm. I think it was important that not only we created the culture that he would, this team member would do that, but also that it was that important. You know, it is important for everyone. It is important. I think that's the thing. People and culture is bigger than payroll right like that's what we're here to talk about and what I really hope that the visionaries and leaders of the organizations are hearing from us right now in our experience is that our team just like our kids or our spouses or our partners or whatever they want time with us they don't want to just it to always constantly be about work and they don't and they don't they should get more than just once or twice a year Right. They're, they've making it, they've made a choice to work for you. Mm-hmm. And, and that was a big choice for them. That loyalty needs to be fostered yeah. and encouraged. And I just want to say, listen, every culture is different. We're just kind of conveying our, our culture that we're building. But if that doesn't appeal to you at all, and that's not the carrot that your team really wants, build the culture that lines up with you and then drive the people in the door that actually fit into that culture in whatever way it looks like. Cause there's some people out there that wouldn't bother them at all to not have that. So I think that's also something that we could say, Marilyn is like, there's no two cultures alike. It, there is a DNA to culture, but we just personally believe to our core that we don't get very far at all without a team. And that requires us to invest a great deal of time, energy, and money into our team as much as it does into our marketing and our client services and everything else that we do. And we were never quite as intentional about people and culture as we are now 18 months into the EOS process. Our people and culture was just kind of an extension of who we were, which I thought was pretty great. But now we have actual a core process around people and culture, and we can be very intentional about making sure we have the right people in the right seat to make sure this part of the organization is staying strong and growing. And then as a result, we're achieving all those things we want on our vision, on our VTO, our vision traction organizer. What else would you say to the person listening right now if they feel like I don't have any of this and I don't have time for any of this and I'm not even sure if I want this? What would you say to that person? Well, I was thinking because you were saying there's all different kind of leaders and uh, there are, are many leaders, brilliant leaders that that this is just not they don't want it. Right. Yeah. And that's that's OK. But what I would challenge you to do is I think across the board, your team needs they need this HR, they need this human resources and the, and the things that we've talked about. So if it's not you, it behoove you to find somebody who, who is wanting to do that yeah. and capable of doing that. And if your team isn't very big and you don't have one like that, and there are third party people that can help you create that. Put the right things in place that you need now and then right. add to it as you go. As grow. you grow. So Um, You can find people to hire people for you and vet people. You know, there are ways to still get what you need without you being the person that does all the work. But again, time, energy, and money, you know, like that's the cost that's bigger than just paying the person, you know, and there's a cost beyond paying them their salary. There's things that they're going to need 
in addition to your time and energy that's going to require money from you. So it's a really big deal. It's a great responsibility and it's a beautiful responsibility that your business is to the point that it can create a job and an opportunity and a culture for someone else. And so mm-hmm. I think that was really the big thing we wanted to convey of like, we get it <laughs> and we believe people and culture is bigger than, than processing payroll. <laughs> And we hope, you know, from today's episode that you're inspired by that, although you might feel a little inadequate or like it's not applicable to you, but hopefully there's been some seed that's been sown that will help you figure that out. And believe me, I'm talking from experience here. I feel inadequate many times, but you just kind of grow into it. You learn it while you're doing it. So, yeah, absolutely. All right, guys, that's a wrap. That was a great episode. Thanks, Marilyn. And thanks for listening to another episode of the Pay, Play, Profit podcast. Thank you for joining us today. Now, before we go, it is sharing is caring time. We want you to join us each week. So if you haven't already hit subscribe for this podcast, whether it's on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere you listen, please do so now. And we would love for you to also consider leaving a five-star review or to share this episode with a fellow e-commerce online or service-based business owner that you think would benefit from gaining more pay, play, and profit in their business and life today. We hope you join us next week. And until then, be kind to yourself and to each other. That's right. Shine and be kind 2022. This is Jessica May and Marilyn signing off, y'all. Bye, guys. See you later.